All right, guys, welcome to Wayne's World Garage. We're at the sawmill again today, and a couple of guys said, well, what all have you all done to this sawmill to make it better? So this video is about all of the improvements we've done. So let me start off with the engine. The engine itself is a Minneapolis Moline engine. So this engine, Minneapolis Moline engine, it's a 605 cubic inch engine, six cylinder engine. Does not have a distributor cap. It has a magneto. So the magnet goes around in circles, Makes spark, it works great, okay? Oil filter, pretty simple. An overflow system for our coolant. This oil filter was put on it just a couple of years ago, it was three years ago as a matter of fact, because it had this old sock type system, which they put on old engines. And the way it was supposed to work is every time you changed your socks in the old days, you're supposed to put your socks in here and that would filter the oil, I'm just kidding. It was a nuisance and hard to work with and nobody would do it. So now we've got a spin on oil filter, a Napa, 1791. So now to change the oil is a whole lot easier. Phil bought some spark plugs. We've got brand new spark plugs in this thing. I think they're the same wires. Did a whole bunch of improvements on the wiring thanks to Pete and some of the guys. We actually have some stuff here to protect it. And that works out really well. As far as the overflow system goes, so if you look up here, look at where this is now. This is the overflow tank. It's a non-pressurized system. So this big radiator, which holds gallons of water, okay, is unlike a modern car, which operates under three, four, five, seven PSI to keep from boiling over. This doesn't get that hot. So what we did though, is you're supposed to fill it up to about a half inch below the top or an inch below the top. It's a good idea. It still ends up when it gets a little bit warm, we'd leak antifreeze out of the top. So what we did is we, put a little pipe fitting here in the cap, the radiator cap, and we ran hoses up to these overflow tanks, and well, uh, there you go. Now, now the biggest part about this is you have to seal this cap when you put the cap on, you can't leave it unsealed. So, thank you to the, the sealant, called the right stuff, it works out great. So that's the cooling system. Let me show you the clutch on this guy. This is a stationary power unit, and stationary power units have clutches associated with them. So the way this works is you push it forward, pull it back, it engages a clutch here, which starts the operation. It starts things moving. It's pretty slick. And that's really about it for the engine. It's an old school engine. It's very low compression, six cylinders. It's only 100 horsepower. Um, it also turns at like 1,000 RPM, and that's the way they built them back then. So think about this, big cylinders moving a huge distance, big connecting rods, lots of torque. So this has a lot of torque, and that's what helps us cut wood so quickly. It's phenomenal. Now, if this guy ever goes, um, goes belly up, we're gonna have some problems. The good news is they're designed to run forever. And so far it's working well. All right, well, things are pretty straightforward on this side. We have a little electric fuel pump since it's not gravity feed anymore. Uh, fuel filter, we replace it every once in a while. Pete knows where to get a, a fuel pump that works. Thank you very much. We put some new hoses on it here because these hoses were all dry rotted. It's a dual carburetor system. It puts out about 100 horsepower. Uh, alternator, Pete fixed the alternator for us. I put a temperature gauge on it. The other thing which is really cool is this is a low oil pressure shutoff switch. So what happens when the oil pressure drops below five PSI, it'll short circuit the magneto and no spark. And without that, the engine's not gonna run. So what it does is if by chance your oil gets low or you lose oil pressure, it saves the engine. It's a modern day computer built in the late 40s. So I'd like to show you how this works just because it is so cool. So what I'll do is I'm gonna move the camera around a little bit closer and then we'll uh, start this guy up and you'll see how it works. So right now, if you tried to start this engine up, it wouldn't do anything because there's no oil pressure and what happens with zero oil pressure, the magneto is short circuited. With short circuit, no spark. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, engine's not gonna run. So what we do here is you have to flip this little lever up. Once you flip that lever up, it it takes, the, it removes a short circuit. Okay, now it's an open circuit, and now we'll get spark. So now we can start the engine. Well, All right, well, with any luck, she'll start up. So what I gotta do here is I'll turn our fuel on. You don't see that, don't need to see that. Give it a little bit of throttle. Turn this on, turn that on. Want to choke her a little bit. I don't know why we do it, but we do choke it a little bit. It seems to help. Make sure our exhaust cap's off and fire away.
Now, is that not the slickest thing since sliced bread or what? Hilariously, this thing is built in the 50s and it works. All right, well, that's a couple details about the engine and the engine just is cool. It's a 100 horsepower engine. We believe it was built in the late 40s. So what did we do next? Well, it came to our attention, we're cutting boards and we're trying to cut one inch boards, four quarter for you woodworker guys. And you know, they're seven eighths of an inch, inch and an eighth. They were not very accurate. Um, and all four sides were different. And if you go to sticker them, which is how we dry them, we'll talk about that later, you couldn't sticker the wood because it's all different sizes. And like, what a nuisance this is. So we started looking into it and trying to figure out what the heck is going on here? How can this be? There's a couple things we had going on. First of all, if you take a look at this saw, I don't know if you can see me or not, but I don't really care. I mean, I do care, I don't really care. But the way this works is the guys come from this side over here and they drop logs off. And when the logs come in, we put them on these big, I don't know, these are four by 12s, big timbers here. We roll the logs forward. Sometimes when we have a bigger log, it doesn't roll quite as swimmingly well as we want. Some of these logs we move are 4,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds. Well, what ends up happening once in a while, maybe one out of every 20 logs, get a little bit too much momentum up, the log comes forward, hits this mechanism, which we're gonna call the carriage, and the carriage comes off these tracks. And like, geez, well, we can put it on because we've got five or six guys, seven, eight guys, not very strong, but you know, we work like Egyptians and we get the thing on. So what we do then is put it back on and we cut more wood. But talking to uh, Mr. John from Frickin' Jeep, he lent us a couple tools to check things out. We ran it, a string line basically from one end of this track to the other and like, wait a minute, something's wrong. How can this be so far off? It was way off. It's off by almost an inch down this end here. Well, what ends up happening is when these logs came forward, this pushed forward, it moved. In addition to the carriage, the tracks got shifted over. Well, if the tracks are shifted over and we're feeding logs going into the, into the big blade you know, in all sorts of different directions, it's not gonna be very accurate. That's a problem, Houston. So what did we do to fix that? The good question. Here's a better picture of the carriage. And you see the carriage has got little wheels on it over here. The wheels right on the little railroad tracks. If they're not perfectly in line and level, we're gonna have a problem. So what we did is we certainly shifted the tracks over to make them sit properly. And we secured them to these timbers, which come under here. Let me show you these big timbers. These are BATs, big American timbers, big piece of wood. And you can see, I, we put some angle iron in there, lag bolted them down. We did that in multiple spots with the understanding this now will not shift if we make a mistake and end up pushing the carriage off of the, the tracks. So let me show you what else we did here. All right, so looking at the saw from this side, this main part of the saw is called the husk, and that's pretty much does not move a whole lot. It's always supposed to be perpendicular and right angles to the circular saw. The thing goes in circles and cuts the wood, okay? But look at the spacing. This was not here. So we had a big timber over to the left, a timber to the right, another timber to the right. These are supposed to be four to six feet apart. And like cheapers crow, that's not the case. We're in trouble here. So what we did is um, we got some sauna tubes and I'll show you this one because I can reach him. Put these sauna tubes in the ground. They're 36 inches in the ground, filled them with concrete, took a drill, drilled some holes in here, put some bolts in and put this I-beam on top of it. Nice piece of I-beam. And uh, I had that lying around the house. And then what we did is took a piece of Ipe wood and shimmed this thing up. And of course the goal is to make this pretty straight and level. And then we secured the rack, the tracks to the Ipe, which is secured to the ground. There's another one of these sauna tubes in here. This was a big project. You know, a bunch of, bunch of old geezers like me trying to dig holes and pour concrete. And it was cold when we did it too. It's always cold when we do these things. But that really straightened our track out. And that was, that was good news because now when boards went down there, we knew they were perfectly flat and they weren't gonna go, you know, like a snake down the path. We still had some problems though. And let me talk about that. All right, so here's our circular saw. This is a 48 inch blade, by the way. And the carriage comes down here. And we had a problem because we're cutting um, logs into boards and the boards were not 90 degrees when you cut them. Like, what's up with that? So thankfully, one of the guys, Pete, came up with the idea, well, let me put a straight edge on, we call them the, whether you call them the ways, the head blocks, the knees, 
the part that holds the log onto this carriage, let's put a straight edge on there and put it up against here and like it should be 90 degrees, right? It wasn't. What the heck, how can that not be 90 degrees? So these things here are, I call them head blocks. I don't know what anybody else calls them, but the head blocks, the head blocks have to be exactly the same, all of them the same. So we ended up buying, and you can see there, that little blue thing right down there, some shim material to shim these up so they're all perpendicular. Then all of a sudden, we started cutting boards and cants that were perpendicular to each other, 90 degrees, and they were square, like, how wonderful is that? So that was a big fix there too. Next thing, what do we do? There's a guy, a uh, YouTube channel, John, John C. up in Mount Airy, Maryland. John, say hi to us, plug for John. Frickin' Jeep, check out his YouTube channel. He's got a lot of good stuff. He knows a lot about these Frick sawmills. And we start talking about the lead, because we're reading books, we're, we're not experts, we're reading this, reading that, looking on the interweb to get information why it's not cutting right. And finally, check your lead on the circular saw, or the blade. And let me explain what that is, because this is really important. This part of the blade, and the back part of it, when it hits a log, this part needs to hit the log before this part does. That's called a lead. And from what we understand, and it's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a FM, flipping magic, on what that number is, a 32nd of an inch, a 16th of an inch, regardless, this part of the circular saw blade here needs to contact the log before this part does. So let's check it out. We did, and our lead was backwards. This part, the back part of the blade, was hitting before this part. Like, well, that's not a good thing. Well, so what's the big deal? Well, what happens is our, our blade, our saw blade, gets hot. It's inefficient, and we lose horsepower. As John uh, Frickin' Jeep mentioned, you can lose up to 30% of your power, okay, if the lead is not set properly on this. So we adjusted the lead. There's a couple little screws back there and bolts and nuts. You adjust this, and we checked it again yesterday, a 32nd of an inch or so. All of a sudden, the circular saw, this blade stops getting hot. Shocking. And frankly, things are cutting a lot better. So we made some huge improvements. That's a big improvement. The lead on the saw was critical. Straightening the tracks was critical. Um, putting extra reinforcement in to the, adding more concrete to support our tracks. These are all critical things. Because of that, we're cutting much, much nicer. We're sawing much nicer boards now. So what do we have here? This is an emergency shutoff switch to short circuit the magneto. If the sawyer is running the sawmill, something's going on, he doesn't know what's happening, hit this, it turns everything off. We put these in, we put three of them in, because the sawyer isn't always able to see everything that's going on. Ideally, he would. But what about the guy down there doing the offloading of our logs and stuff, see something going on, what do we do? We put a switch down there, we put a switch up here. So we've got three of these switches we put in here to help in case something goes wrong. If somebody sees something, turn it off. You don't like something, turn it off. Keep things safe, and that's what we're doing here. So my terminology could be wrong, so I apologize in advance if I'm not saying it right. We call these things the knees. We call this thing the head block. This is the carriage, goes on the tracks. Attached to the knee, if you see at the back end of it, is a gear. That is called, we call that the rack, okay? And I'll show you some good pictures of this thing these head blocks, uh, we just finished building three of those. Brand new ones, basically, out of steel. They're pretty big. It's almost four inches by one and a half inches. It's got to be machined in here for a slot. It's got to fit perfectly. It's got this welded on. The, the rack, that big gear, has to fit in here when it's secured to here. And now what happens when you go back and forth, this thing is not moving 45 degrees in either direction. Now, does that make a whole lot of difference? I don't know. But I'll show you some pictures of what we have and it is so bad, it was to the point where this was going to almost break. The metal was so thin, it was less than a sixteenth of an inch thick. And there's a huge loading on this thing, and what do you mean? Well, put a log on here, we put these things, these are called the dogs, slide the dog out, and when we go into the saw, it's pushing this way, there's a big force going like this. So this thing is, wants to break off going this way. The underneath of this side here, of this head block, was almost worn out. So. Additionally, when this metal wears, the rack gear wore also. So let me show you a couple pictures of that and how we fixed it. So hopefully you can see this okay. 
But take a look at this right here and look at how thin that metal is. Not acceptable, it's almost worn out. Now look at this other side, it's almost a quarter inch thick still. And the way it's set up, that's because the loading and all the wear happens on one side. And we are almost to the point where if we kept running it like this, this metal is so thin it was gonna break off. I'd hate to see that hit the circular saw and the damage it would cause. So we ended up getting some metal. This is three eighths of an inch thick steel from our pals at LR Wilson. Thank you guys for donating that. We really appreciate it. And fortunately, we've got some equipment at home. So we machined the slots in here, welded these guys up, drilled some holes in it, slapped them back together, and we're good to go. Way easier sounding than it is in real life. That's for sure. Now here, I call these our toothbrushes. So you can see here's this track I was talking about and these wheels behind it, you see the wheel back there, rolls on the track. Well, when you're cutting, when you're sawing lumber, what exactly happens? Sawdust piles up on here. So Phil went to the dollar store, which doesn't sell anything for a dollar anymore, and bought some brushes, except he couldn't buy them at the dollar store because they don't have dollar brushes. They're too cheap. So he paid, I don't know what he paid, but he bought a whole bunch of brushes, secured them here, and now we've got new brushes, toothbrushes for this guy. And it's so much happier because now the tracks stay clear. Wonderful, good job, Phil. Okay, now this we're exceptionally proud of. So let me show you back here. Remember this little carriage with these head blocks of the galvanized steel, logs go on here. They go on the head blocks, the knees hold them in place, they move them to the circular saw, and we saw boards, wonderful. They ride up and down on this railroad track here, powered by this big pulley, which goes this big cable back to these other pulleys back here. Well, Gary saw on wood a couple times. He said, dude, something's not working right. It's just, we're just having a problem. So we took a look, and uh, I think Phil's our, our analyst. Phil took a look at and he said, hey, something's wrong here with these pulleys. So what we ended up doing is, you can see there's a brand new bolt in that guy. The bearings in it, of course, were shot because they were probably 50 years old. Put new bearings in it, new bushings in it, and now she's good to go. But what about the other end? And exactly, it's the same type of pulley at the other end, except fortunately that one had standard, bullet, uh, standard pulley bushings. Uh, that one had standard bearings in it, and we could get them from Jeff Bezos at Amazon. So a $30 fix instead of a $100 fix, and we got this back in action and ready to rock and roll. So it makes a huge, huge difference. So while we're busy troubleshooting this and rebuilding our head blocks and our rack gears and all that blah, 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 I think it was Alan came up with the idea. It's like every once in a while, when you pull this knee too far forward, this gear here, which you see under here, nicely machined, Wayne, good job, goes too far forward and does not contact the pinion anymore. And then it's kind of a nuisance because you have to reset everything back up, make sure it's all lined up. He says, well, why don't we just put a stop on it? So this piece of half inch steel, with this little thing here, will prevent the knees from going too far forward. And that actually does two things. One, it prevents the gears from becoming disconnected and us having to realign everything. But at the same time, our head blocks, we don't want them really too close to that saw. If we were doing it commercially, had to squeeze every half inch out of every log, we would do that. We want to be a little bit safe. What ends up happening when we push the limit is the last board, which is on the carriage, can potentially fall off because there's not enough steel underneath it holding it on. This will prevent us from trying to overdo it and cut too thin of a board. Brilliant idea. So we just put two of these on it. Now we got to bring an a angle grinder and uh, flatten these edges because this is probably sharp enough to sharp enough to cut my, my beard or something like that. So one of the things I just want to convey to people is this is always an ongoing effort. I know this only gets used a couple hours a week, two or three hours a week but we probably haven't stayed up on maintaining it all along. So we're doing a lot better at doing that now. We're greasing things, we're oiling things. When Gary was having problems pushing the carriage back and forth, by the way, this is what does that. It wasn't having problems, this is not feeling right. The first place we looked at were these pulleys, these, and there's idler pulleys here. It's, it's kind of cool arrangement. You tension's this way and it goes that way, pull it that way, it goes that way. It's brilliant. These guys, whenever this doggone thing was built, they had their act together and they were pretty smart. We thought there was a ton of slop in these guys here, this one and that one. So I said, well, let me just take them home. Took them home. There's big uh, one and a half inch pins or whatever they, whatever they are. Yeah, they're one and a quarter inch pins that go through here. I made new pins up, put zerk fittings in them, put new bushings in these guys. 
slapped him back on, we're good to go. Until yesterday. And yesterday, Phil and I were looking at things, and he says, man, something's not right. Why is this, why is this pulley always over here? And like, I don't know, Phil. Maybe we need to adjust something. And I thought we had to adjust something. But if you look carefully, there's a left and right side to this pulley and that pulley. And like, what? And unfortunately, Brilliant Us did not have them back on properly. We had them reversed. So what happens was they were sitting over here and over there, and things weren't good. Fortunately, 10 minute fix, loosen this bolt up, pull the pin out, flip the pulleys over, we're back in business. Again, that was Phil's idea. He's a brilliant one who could look at this stuff and say something ain't right, which he seems to do a lot. And then we could fix it though. So good deal. So real quick and easy, those are a bunch of the improvements we've made over the last couple of years. The good news is we're sawing really nice boards now. They're square and they're straight and people are starting to want the lumber, which raises up a good question. What do we do with all the wood? This was an old farm. There's thousands and thousands of feet of fencing, and they constantly need fence boards. So what do we do? And you've seen some of my videos on Wayne's World Garage. We bring 17-foot logs or 16-and-a-half-foot logs, and we cut fence boards, which are 5-quarter or 4-quarter by 16-and-a-half-foot. It's wonderful. Those guys are all happy. We're happy. Additionally, if the Boy Scouts come up with a project, which they seem to every once in a while, they don't want to paint the sawmill, by the way, or clean it, which is kind of too bad. We'd hope we could get them to help, but hope's not a plan. What we'll do is they come to us and say, hey, can we get some boards? And of course, we're happy to do it. So we've got logs, and if they need two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, we cut them for us, we saw them for them, and then we give them the boards, and that works out pretty well. And the guys at the wood shop, they're building some pens for the goats or chickens or horses or cow, whatever they have here, and they need to get wood. Well, how much does a two by six cost at Home Depot now? I don't know, but it's probably $10 or $12 each. Two by sixes here don't cost them a nickel. So thank you so much, because we have the privilege of running this and operating this wonderful sawmill. So we saw a lot of boards. So real quick, that's what we do with everything. If you have any questions, you guys, please leave a comment. Subscribe, watch more videos, please. Come out someday and say hi to us. We're happy to see you. If we're busy working or pretending to work, that's probably more like it. We may not hear you or we'll just ignore you. So don't be bashful of you. Come on out, say hi, make some noise and uh, get to know us. Uh, we have fun. We always need a couple of uh, people stronger than, stronger than me. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this video.